So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce Carla Kim today. Uh, we had her out to UCLA a few years before the pandemic, and we hope to certainly have her back um, as soon as we can. So Carla is a professor of genetics and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. She's also co-leader of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. She is truly an expert in lung progenitor cells, lung disease, including cancer. She's uh, made a major contribution defining epithelial and non-epithelial cell types and signaling pathways and how they regulate progenitor cell self-renewal and differentiation, as well as dysfunction. Um, she's made use of in vivo models, incredible 3D models. Uh, one of her um, most defining studies early on where she identified uh, progenitor population at the bronchio-alveolar duct junction, just looked it up, has been cited more than 2,500 times, which is just mind blowing. Um, she's received a number of really impressive awards, including a V Scholar, a uh, Research Scholar from American Cancer Society, and R35 from the NIH. And so uh, I'm really excited to hear about her research today. Thank you for coming, Carla. Thank you so much, Andrew. I want to thank you and the entire committee for the invitation today. And I look forward to uh, being there in person again soon. Uh, so apologies, but it says it dis that the host disabled screen sharing. <laughs> you should be go. able to. OK, now it's working. There we go. All right, can you see that OK? Looks good. Perfect. All right. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here and to tell you some of uh, the newer uh, projects going on in my lab. And uh, what we are really interested in is using stem cell approaches uh, to really better understand lung biology and lung disease. And uh, I like to uh, use this slide just to highlight some of the common features that we think about how to approach this question. When we think about the major lung diseases that are listed here, uh, you know most of these. Uh, one thing they have in common is that there is either a decrease in the number or the function of the epithelial cells, either those that line our airways, the bronchiolar cells, or those in the alveolar space where gas exchange occurs. And this is illustrated here on these H&E sections where on the right is an image from an H&E stained section of uh, lung from an emphysema patient compared to more normal lung tissue on the left. And you can see this is clearly, it's a very complex disease, but there are certainly enlarged air spaces. Uh, and you can imagine this could be a problem of epithelial cell maintenance. Now, even though we know these diseases involve the epithelial cells, we don't know entirely, especially at the early stages, to what extent is that a failure of perhaps a stem cell population that maintains these cells, or whether it's also a possibly an issue of other cell-cell interactions. So that's what we hope to learn more about. When we think about these questions, uh, most of our work has focused on the mouse lung, which is shown here in cartoon version. And thinking about the epithelial cell types, we know that throughout the pulmonary system and the lung, that there are at least three major niches or microenvironments where uh, very key types of epithelial cells live. And that includes the trachea, uh, the bronchioles, and the alveolar space. And you can see here in this cartoon that there are a variety of different cell types that line these places, and they have a, a very discrete um, function every moment that we're breathing. Uh, in particular, in the alveolar space where gas exchange occurs, these very thin alveolar type 1 cells uh, exchange gas with capillaries, and that is also made possible by the alveolar type 2 cell, the AT2 cell shown here, uh, which produces surfactant that makes that exchange possible. So we need these cells uh, every moment, but cells in these three regions also act as the stem or progenitor cells that maintain these cell types. And they also interact very closely with 
fibroblasts, other mesenchyme, and of course, immune and other types of cells that aren't pictured here. So we really wanna get a handle on these uh, cell types and their interactions, and then what might go wrong in lung diseases. So uh, with that in mind, I've shown you the major niches. Now, when we think about what are the actual stem or progenitor, the terms I'll use interchangeably today, because I'm focusing here on the adult lung tissue, where we think that there are specialized uh, progenitor cells. Now, many lines of evidence has shown, especially uh, in the distal lung, which we'll be focusing on today, that there are multiple types of epithelial cells that can act as progenitors. And that includes cells that line our airways, the bronchial or secretory club cell that's pictured here, they're a columnar epithelial cell. Uh, it includes uh, the cells that uh, we named during my postdoctoral studies, the Basque population that Andrew mentioned, which uh, others have gone on to show in lineage tracing can give rise to both bronchiolar and alveolar cell types after injury, as well as the alveolar type two cells that I mentioned, and many different subtypes of these various cells. So one uh, question that really is still an, a very open question in the field is why does the distal lung need so many different progenitor cell types? Is there a functional redundancy? Do they have distinct roles or no? And if we uh, take an even closer look at those cell types, the ones we think about most often, uh, I just wanna highlight that almost every one of these cell types shown here has been shown to have some kind of progenitor cell activity, perhaps with the exclusion of the ciliated cells, which are thought to be uh, one of the most terminally differentiated cell types. And what I mean by uh, that it being demonstrated that they can act as progenitors, I mean that upon particular injury context in vivo, that they are proliferative and they may give rise to more specialized cell types. For example, club cells are proliferative and they can give rise to ciliated cells. Uh, and uh, even more uh, differentiated cells like AT1 cells have recently been shown to have the potential to give rise to type two cells under certain injury contexts. So we hope that by studying uh, any one of these various cell types and those that we can uh, most uh, model most in the most physiologically close uh, systems that we can learn about this diversity of cells in the lung and how and what regulates the balance of their various progenitor cell activities. Uh, when we think about studying these uh, multipotent stem cells here, the BAS, uh, we also can take advantage of cell surface markers that we've identified on these cells in the past. For example, we can use SCA1 uh, to enrich for this population and study their uh, capacity. Now, uh, over the years, uh, what Zhu Hyung Li a former postdoc in the lab uh, has developed along with many others in my group uh, is the establishment of an organoid co-culture system uh, that we have really enjoyed uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, just to show you how we set up these cultures, uh, in this slide, I'm showing you that we isolate the Scowin positive epithelial cells from the adult lung. We mix them with different types of mesenchymal lung stromal cells. Uh, we mix that with matrigel and put it in a trans well in an air liquid interface. And what we see with this uh, multipotent uh, progenitor population is that we can derive uh, bronchiolar organoids. These organoids are lined by cells that stain positive for uh, airway or bronchiolar markers, such as what I'm showing you here in red is CCSP a club cell marker. Uh, the same population of cells can also yield alveolar organoids such as those shown on the bottom panel. And these organoids stain positive for alveolar cell markers such as uh, surfactant protein C or SPC, which is shown here in green. So this uh, gives us a window into uh, two of the major uh, lineages of cells in the distal lung. Uh, and it also gives us the opportunity uh, to model how these epithelial cells interact with other cell types. We've 
uh, gone on to make use of this organoid system and to use it to ask uh, in a number of different mouse models of lung disease, uh, how these various cell types interact and how it might regulate their uh, differentiation when there is a disease state. And I just wanna highlight one of those model systems. Uh, and before I do that, um, one other system I wanted to show you was that in contrast to this slide where I've shown you the organoids that we obtain with the Skawin positive multipotent progenitors, uh, that we can also use um, uh, I am enrichment for the Skawin negative epithelial cells. Uh, this gives us uh, an AT2 enriched cell population. And when we put those cells in our organoid conditions, uh, they exclusively grow the alveolar organoid type. Uh, you can see here at an early time point that the majority of the cells express SPC, the AT2 marker. But over the time course of this culture period, the cells in the middle are no longer resembling AT2 cells, and instead they stain positive for potoplatin here in green below uh, and other uh, alveolar type one cell markers. And so in this culture of system, we can also observe the differentiation of AT2 cells into the AT1 cell. So with these uh, tools in mind, as I mentioned, we can model uh, these various uh, important lung cell types. Um, most recently, uh, we've used these to model a number of different disease states. Uh, and I'm first just going to highlight how we've used this to establish a tumor organoid system. I won't go into the details of this too much, but uh, because it is published, but I just wanted to highlight this system. Uh, first, uh, in order to begin this work, we made use of KRAS uh, conditional mice, which have an oncogenic mutation of KRAS that is dependent on creativity. Now, these mice were developed in Tyler Jack's lab, and they've been critical for understanding tumor progression in a way that we can't do so with patient samples. And that is because we know exquisitely when we activate oncogenic KRAS uh, and then follow these mice over different time points. It's still, however, an open question, exactly what happens to a normal epithelial cell at the very earliest stages when it begins to express an oncogene like KRAS. And so that's what we set out to do using our organoid system. And so what Antonella Dost, a former graduate student did, was to take those KRAS mice or those that also had a conditional allele of P53 she enriched for the AT2 cells using the fact scheme listed here. And then she either infected those cells with an adeno empty virus or a Cree virus, and then plated them in our organoid conditions. And what Nella was able to show was that either with KRAS or the combination of oncogenic KRAS and P53 deletion, that the organoids that grew in these cultures uh, very quickly, uh, as early as seven days, begin to exhibit atypical nuclei, and that over uh, the a very short time course in these cultures, they can even develop these multi-nucleated giant cells. And we were thrilled with this result because the nuclear morphology in these organoids really resembled those that occur in the genetically engineered mouse models of the same uh, genotype in vivo. And so uh, we also went on to characterize these tumor organoid cells. Uh, we showed with our transplantation system that if we deliver those uh, KRAS tumor organoids uh, and into recipient mouse lungs, that they are tumorigenic. On the left are h &E images of a mouse that received normal lung organoids. And the point of these images is that it appears normal as it should. The middle panel is showing you lung tissue from a mouse that received KRAS oncogenic tumor organoids, and on the right, a mouse that received KRAS P53 tumor organoids. So we were uh, happy to see that we could begin this system with a normal lung alveolar cell, activate KRAS in the dish, and then these cells are still uh, put, have the capacity to make a tumor when they're returned back to the lung environment. 
Now, in this system, we characterize the gene expression changes that occur upon oncogenic RAS. And one of the um, features that we saw in those cells was that a very early change is that they lose expression of the predominant AT2 cell marker genes, and they begin to express markers of lung progenitor uh, cell genes such as SOX9 or uh, other um, genes associated with uh, mesenchymal changes or advanced stage lung cancer changes such as HMGA2. And we could confirm that finding uh, from sequencing in our immunofluorescence, uh, excuse me, uh, in our uh, tumor organoid cultures. Uh, for example, we can see that whereas some organoids maintain their AT2 status upon KRAS activation, uh, many of these organoid cells lose SPC and they begin to express these uh, markers such as HMGA2. Now we wondered whether this could be an artifact of the organoid culture system. This was actually something that had been shown in the mouse models, but only at a very advanced stage of the cancer. So we wondered, does this actually happen early in the mice, but perhaps was missed? Or again, is this just because we're putting them in the culture conditions? So to answer that, Aaron Moye, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, uh, went back to the mouse model. He administered uh, adenocree to those mice, and at a very early time point of seven weeks, he isolated the various cellular fractions, including KRAS-activated epithelial cells. And when he performed the sequencing of those cells, and he combined all the data from mice that got CRE, meaning activated RAS, with those that had not, uh, it was uh, a surprising finding. Uh, he found, first of all, that he could identify AT2 cells, ciliated cells, club cells, all the major cell types we would expect. But there were two clusters of AT2 cells uh, down here, one in green, uh, which is from the mice, uh, the YFP positive reporter cells. These are the cells that would have activated KRS. And another cluster up here that were uh, from the control mice. And this data uh, is shown in another way over here based on the sample identification. Uh, so the mixture of cells in most of the clusters indicated that the gene expression pattern of the ciliated or club cells was not really different when they had activated KRAS. However, the AT2 cells form completely different transcriptional clusters uh, when they have activated RAS versus the control cells. So this told us that AT2 cells indeed at a very early time point in the animal model, just as our organoids predicted, begin to look less like themselves and less like an AT2 cell. Now, uh, I wanted to especially show this result and highlight it here for this audience um, because it was almost exactly uh, two years ago that I had the pleasure of coming and speaking here when Bridget Gompertz invited me. Uh, and I showed some of the data that I just showed you. And then uh, Lynn Tron uh, and, and uh, Constantinian, and I apologize, I've missed the rest of your name here, uh, met with me right after my seminar that day. And Lynn showed me some of the data that she had from sequencing human lung cancers. And what Lynn uh, and Jane Yanagawa and Steve Dubonnet were very generous with their data and we ended up collaborating for this publication. And what they saw was that uh, they were uh, doing sequencing from uh, patients that were having a uh, stage 1A lung cancers removed by surgery, along with normal lung tissue from the same patient. And then they performed single cell RNA-seq. And they, very much like what I showed you, they were able to identify clusters of the cell types that we would expect from those samples, but they also had two clusters of AT2 cells shown here in this larger cluster. And that happened to match up with the more, uh, the normal lung tissue from the patients. And this smaller cluster down here, which was from the stage 1A cancer sample. And when uh, Lynn uh, analyzed uh, her sequencing data, and she interrogated a gene signature of AT2 cell markers, 
she saw the same thing that we saw in our organoids and in our mouse model. And that was that the stage 1A lung cancer cells that were in the AT2-like cluster uh, also have lower uh, expression of those AT2 marker genes. And so that indicated to us that uh, this also ha ha shows that um, patients with uh, KRAS mutant lung cancers also exhibit these uh, changes in AT2 cell marker genes. So we're very grateful that we could do that collaboration uh, as a result, direct result of having a meeting like this today. And I hope that um, we can do more of those in the future uh, and lead to more collaborations. So just in a quick summary for this part, I've shown you that we have established these organized systems and we can use them to reveal uh, changes that occur uh, in more physiologically relevant settings and also in patients. And we're using this system now to get a better handle on what might be more uh, interesting drug targets and other changes that occur in the early stages of this disease. So this in a way um, validates, uh, I think, the use of our system uh, for uh, asking questions about lung diseases. Now, if we return to the, the long list of lung diseases we want to understand, when we think about the major, um, most of the, those listed here, like emphysema, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, and cancer, uh, it actually turns out that aging is one of the most predominant risk factors of these diseases. You can see the data here on this slide, which emphasizes the fact that lung cancer is a disease of age. Uh, this is also true for the, the other lung diseases. And of course, uh, we've heard a lot about mortality associated with COVID-19 disease as well. Uh, now, why, why does this happen? What makes this increased risk? Uh, so uh, in this uh, uh, figure, which is highlighted from a review that we were a part of writing, uh, highlights some of the changes that are known to happen in the uh, adult lung with age. We know that some of the abundance of various lung cell types changes. We know that in some mouse models, there are compromised repair of lung injury. And uh, as with many tissues, uh, there is uh, certainly, uh, there are epigenetic changes that occur with age in the lung. But we still know really very little about exactly which cell types uh, a change and especially how progenitor functions are altered uh, with age in the lung. And so we uh, started to ask this question uh, and to use uh, both uh, our uh, mouse tissue sections and also our uh, organoid assay to ask this question in more detail. So what uh, Patricia Pazina and Carolina Garcia de Alba in my lab did was to take uh, young mice, typically about eight weeks old, compared to old mice, such as 22 months old, and they compared lung tissue sections. When they stained them uh, for AT2 cell markers, such as SPC, and then quantified that, what you can see here is there, were, uh, there was a significant decrease in the number of AT2 cells in the mouse aged lung. Uh, and in contrast, when they quantified uh, the uh, Basque-like population, the, those cells that have SPC and CCSP, there was a significant increase in these progenitors in the older mice. Uh, furthermore, when the, we uh, checked these cell types by flow, uh, we could see the same result. And when we used facts to enrich for these populations and then plate them in the organoid cultures, we could see that these lung progenitor cells also have uh, a defect in their function. So first, when we plated uh, the AT2 cells, we see that there are fewer alveolar organoids that grow from the old um, lung AT2 cells. And when we plate the more multipotent progenitor population, they also have a significant decrease in the ability to give rise to alveolar organoids. And in contrast, we see more abundant bronchiolar organoids from these cultures. Now, we wanted to begin to understand what are some of the uh, mechanisms that might cause these changes with aging, and then 
to understand how does that affect their progenitor activity. Um, so uh, if we think about the hallmarks of aging that's been published in uh, the paper shown here, one of the uh, predominant changes that's known to occur in many systems with age is uh, alteration of epigenetic marks. And that can include a number of different marks uh, as shown here. And among those include uh, histone modifications. And so uh, this can include um, increased uh, modification and especially decreases in the methylation of uh, key uh, lysine uh, marks. In particular, uh, we had in the past uh, studied one particular mark, lysine 9 methylation, uh, in the context of lung cancer. And so we checked whether or not young versus old lung tissue has a difference in this mark. And indeed, when we stained tissues for this methylation and quantified it, there was a significant um, decrease in this methylation uh, in the old mouse lung tissue. Now, there are certainly uh, changes in other epigenetic marks, uh, but some do not appear to change in our studies. But having experience with this mark, we went on to ask more about it. We had also uh, used uh, inhibitors uh, of, of this, uh, the enzyme that places this mark in our previous cancer studies. Uh, that enzyme is called G9A. Uh, G9A works together with GLP as a methyl transferase to uh, both um, mono and dimethylate um, lysine 9. Uh, and there are uh, inhibitors available that block this activity, uh, including a compound called UNC0638. Now we had seen in the past that when we treat lung cancer cells with this inhibitor, that it actually expands the lung tumor propagating cell population. And given that we had seen changes in this methylation mark with age, we wanted to know what impact it might have on normal uh, lung epithelial progenitors and whether that could have some association with the changes we see with age. And so uh, first what Sam Robathon, a staff scientist in my lab and now an instructor at MGH uh, did was to take um, wild type mice and isolate our favorite cell types and treat them with this G9A inhibitor. Uh, when he did that, he saw uh, very much like I showed you with the aged mouse lung cells, that there was uh, in the alveolar enriched population, the SCAWA negative population, excuse me, uh, there was a decrease in alveolar organoid forming efficiency. That was true also when we used the multipotent progenitor population, there were fewer alveolar organoids. So that recapitulated um, one of the phenotypes we had seen with age. Now, it had already been shown, uh, as listed in the publication here on this slide, that when old mice are treated with damaging agents that damage the lung alveolar space, such as bleomycin, that the old mice are um, less able to recover from this type of injury. Uh, bleomycin injury um, results in uh, fibrosis and ablation of alveolar cells. Sorry, my slide advancer is very sensitive today. Uh, and uh, a wild type a young mouse can repair this kind of injury uh, over uh, a few months time. Um, and you can see here uh, in these images from the paper uh, that a young mouse uh, has this extensive uh, lung damage, which does get resolved, but old mice uh, uh, have this um, continued damage in the lung. So this was already known to be an aged phenotype. So we wondered, would the G9A inhibited mice exhibit a similar phenotype? So we treated mice uh, with the UNC drug, the G9A inhibitor for two weeks that uh, depletes the methylation mark. And then uh, the mice were injured with bleomycin. And then we waited for that uh, resolution and repair timeframe uh, to see the phenotype. And here, what you can see uh, in control PBS mice, there's very little difference uh, with G9A inhibition on these uh, two panels. But on the right, when the mice were treated with bleomycin, the vehicle treated mice uh, had um, 
but mostly resolved this kind of injury, but the mice with G9A inhibition uh, had these um, uh, patches of lung damage. Now, uh, it might have seemed that these patches would be lung fibrosis. However, when we stain them for markers of uh, such as trichrome, uh, it, these areas of damage were not fibrosis or fibroblasts per se, uh, but instead they appear to be uh, aberrant epithelial cell types. And so uh, we stained them for CCSP here in this slide with IHC. Uh, and you can see that the G9A inhibited lung tissue that had the bleomycin injury compared to vehicle bleotreated lungs uh, has a predominant um, clusters of CCSP positive cells in the alveolar space. Ooh, sorry. Now, you do see uh, some of this uh, kind of cells in the control mouse, but again, they seem to resolve, whereas with the lysine-9 methylation depletion by the G9A inhibition, we see uh, more abundant um, of these CCSP positive cells, that is, uh, cells with the bronchiolar cell type that seem to stick around in the alveolar space. When we also, when we performed immunofluorescence and quantified these cell types, again, you can see here in red, the same marker CCSP and how there are many more uh, abundant um, red cells uh, that was quantified as a significant increase in the mice with G9A inhibitors. And we also saw an increase in the number of double positive cells, which have that Basque phenotype um, was also expanded in these mice. So, so far I've shown you that with age, uh, there is a persistent lung damage that occurs that seems to be uh, similar to the changes that we can, um, um, we seem to be able to mimic those changes when we deplete lysine-9 methylation by inhibiting G9A. And we see that alveolar type two cells are defective and there seems to be more abundant bronchiolar progenitors and that they uh, are expanded in vivo. So we wanted to know whether or not uh, we were directly impacting a bronchiolar progenitor pool when we uh, inhibit G9A in these mice. So we went back to the mice that had that inhibitor, in this case, without any lung injury. And indeed, we saw that the Scowin positive fraction um, in those mice that contains those uh, multipotent progenitors that can make bronchiolar and alveolar cells was expanded. And when we uh, plated equal numbers of that population from mice that were either vehicle or G9A treated, we saw that uh, in our organoid cultures that the G9A inhibited uh, cells from the mice that got this drug, uh, when we plated equal numbers to compare those cells, there was a more uh, significant increase in bronchiolar organoid formation from that progenitor pool. So this was telling us that uh, similar to what we had seen in vivo in the organoid culture, that the bronchiolar pro um, potential of this progenitor population was enhanced uh, when we inhibit G9A. And uh, finally, we wanted to bring it back to what's happening in the old mice. So I've shown you that when we inhibit this uh, methylation mark, that we can mimic many of the phenotypes of age. And now uh, we went back to ask, because we are seeing what looks like enhanced bronchiolar progenitor activity with uh, inhibiting this methylation mark, does that also happen with age? And so we took old mice. In this case, we injured them with naphthalene. Naphthalene is a chemical that depletes club cells. And again, a normal young mouse can repair this kind of injury over a very rapid time course of about 14 days. Uh, and we did see that um, to be the case in our experiments. But you can see here in this slide in a young mouse at day seven, that many of the club cells have not yet been filled into this airway. Whereas in contrast, and we did this with old mice, uh, there was an almost even hyperproliferative uh, state of the club cells where still many areas 
are still damaged, but there are many more club cells filling in the airways here in the old mice. So this suggests that we also see a similar phenotype in old mouse lung of an enhanced bronchiolar progenitor activity. So you may be wondering, um, how does this work? And why does uh, G9A, why does this methylation mark uh, cause this phenotype? And we're still trying to figure this out, but one of the clues we have uh, is that, as I mentioned to you, uh, or perhaps I forgot to, is that again, the methylation mark placed by G9A is known to be largely repressive. Uh, and so it would repress the transcription by regulating chromatin accessibility. And so we performed ATAC sequencing in various progenitor cell populations from mice that had been uh, treated with G9A inhibitor. Uh, interestingly, we saw that the population that had the most significant change in the peaks in our ATAC-seq data, meaning more enhanced accessible genes, was in the uh, Scowen positive CD24 low population, which we know is the population enriched for bronchiolar progenitor activity. In contrast, the AT2 cells uh, with SCAL1, the SCAL1 negative population, had less significant changes upon G9A inhibition. And uh, what we thought was really interesting is when we looked more closely at the genes uh, with these uh, accessibility changes in this population, there was a significant increase in accessibility of club cell signature genes. Uh, and you can see that here where the blue peaks are the vehicle uh, treated uh, cells and G9A inhibited uh, cells from G9A inhibited mice are here in red. Uh, and this is the, the gene SCGB3A1. This is one of a family member of CCSP, which is a club cell um, gene. And down here, SCGB3A2, uh, another club cell identity gene. And so it appears that G9A may help directly influence uh, accessibility uh, and expression of genes uh, that uh, lead to a more club cell uh, identity. So putting all of this together, uh, what I've shown you so far uh, is that a decrease in this methylation mark uh, is found in aging lung. It correlates uh, with an act, a change in the progenitor cell frequency and activity. Uh, we see that depleting this methylation mark in young mice reduces the AT2 cell activity and it increases BASC and proge bronchiolar progenitor cell activity. And finally, when we deplete this mark, uh, we see that there is a difference in accessibility of club cell genes. And this might be one of the reasons why aged lungs uh, are more susceptible to infection and lung disease. So just uh, putting that, those conclusions into a little bit more of a perspective for you. So what we think uh, is happening here on the left uh, in this cartoon is um, healthy lung or young lung. Uh, and uh, in this cartoon, I've shown you the airway cells and the alveolar cells. Uh, and upon uh, different kinds of injury, we know, as I've shared with you, that various types of progenitor cells, the club cells, the AT2 cell, the BASC, are capable of uh, self-renewal or differentiation to repair those injuries. However, what we see when we uh, inhibit uh, G9A or remove this methylation mark or with age is that there is reduced abundance of the AT2 population uh, there. And upon injury in these settings, uh, there is a predominance of bronchiolar cell phenotypes and a diminution of the AT2 cell phenotype. Now, the one way we think this may happen is that the marks mediated by G9A uh, which normally represses airway cell genes in these bronchiolar progenitors um, is now released in these conditions, which is, allows these progenitors to express more of the airway cell genes and thus have this bronchiolar cell identity. And what's really interesting to us that connects this finding to Lyme disease and age is that uh, an abnormal uh, uh, predominance of of cells in the alveolar space that have airway cell phenotypes 
is a hallmark of some lung diseases, including um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis uh, and perhaps other lung diseases. So uh, we're interested in further exploring these mechanisms and how it may impact susceptibility to aging and cancer. Now, if we have probably just a couple more minutes, I'll just uh, tell you one more quick story. Um, so I've shown you so far how we've used organoids to model disease like cancer, how we're trying to use it to understand mechanisms of disease and aging. And of course, one other thing that we still want to do uh, is to better understand progenitor cell potential in vivo and potentially at some point, think about how we might uh, approach cell-based therapy for some of the lung diseases that might need cell replacement. And so with those goals in mind, we've been working on developing methods to transplant cells that we grow in our organoid culture conditions and deliver them back into recipient mouse lungs. So we've been doing this with um, an experimental setup as shown here, where we uh, start with DS red um, mice, we isolate our favorite cell populations, and then after 21 days in culture, we obtain single cell suspensions of those cultures, and then we intratracheally uh, transplant them uh, back into mice that have received bleomycin injury the day before. And we then interrogate those recipient mice uh, to see uh, if we've retained the cells we delivered uh, and what are their effects. And for some of these slides, I'm just going to refer to the organoids that came from the alveolar type two enriched Skawin negative population as the snow cells or Skawin negative organoids. Uh, so when we uh, deliver those uh, Skawin negative organoid cells, uh, into recipient mice, we can see there are DS red positive cells in the mouse lung. And when we stain the tissue of those recipient mouse lungs, we can find scattered DS red positive cells that are also positive for SPC, shown here in the overlap of the red and green staining. And here you can also see other um, AT2 cells that are positive for SPC, but negative for red. So those are the endogenous uh, recipient mouse AT2 cells. So we like the fact that when we deliver these cells, they seem to go to the right place and they have the right marker, at least by immunofluorescence. Uh, and we wanted to know more about whether these cells still retain their progenitor cell activity. Um, first, we also wanted to characterize these cells in more detail. Um, we uh, confirmed that the cells that we delivered when they were from alveolar organoids, they were negative for airway cell markers. So they're negative for CCSP or SOX2 or P63. Um, and we also checked though, to see if the cells we transplanted were positive for AT1 cell markers. I mentioned to you earlier in the talk that in our alveolar cultures, we do see differentiation to type one cells. However, somewhat disappointingly, we've seen that when we transplant those cells, we have uh, little or no evidence that we are seeing any AT1 cells uh, from our transplanted cells. So we don't really see cells that look like um, HOPX positive AT1 cells that are also red. Uh, nonetheless, we wanted to understand these uh, transplanted cells better. And so we performed single cell RNA sequencing of them. So 84 days after transplanting, we isolated the DS red positive transplanted cells. We isolated their native counterpart that was DS red negative, SCAL1 negative. And we also sequenced the organoid cells that were from a same time point as those that we had transplanted. And when we combined all of that data, as you can see here on this U map, uh, we were very pleased to see, as we might have hoped from the staining pattern seen, that the transplanted cells and the native cells um, overlap in the same transcriptional clusters. Now, it was also interesting to us that the organoid cells formed their own distinct cluster. So even though we know that our alveolar organoid cells stain for SPC and some of our favorite markers, 
they're still not exactly identical to a freshly sorted AT2 cell. They're still closer to that than any other lung cell type. However, they're not exactly uh, like their normal cells. But what's interesting to us is that cells that are maintained in these organoid conditions return to their normal state after they're transplanted back uh, into the lungs. And just honing in a little bit closer, this cluster of cells here from the sequencing data is the one that has the most similarity to mature AT2 cells. And you can see where uh, the cell data from the native and the transplanted cells is overlapping. Now, as I mentioned, we wanted to know if the cells we delivered still had progenitor cell capacity. And so we uh, took the mice that we had transplanted, either with those SNOW or even SPO, which is the multipotent progenitor. We gave the mice another round of bleomycin injury and performed BRDU labeling. And we compared the native versus the transplanted cells for BRDU incorporation in those recipient mouse lungs. And we saw that the transplanted cells in both contexts were equally able to proliferate after a second round of injury in vivo, showing that they have a progenitor cell capacity. And we also tested their function by taking the cells that had been transplanted into the recipient mice, again, isolating them again, and then plating them in our organoid conditions. And we saw that the snow recipient mouse cells, and again, those are the alveolar enriched, uh, they retained a memory in that they only gave rise to alveolar organoids, whereas uh, the cells that came from mice that received the multipotent cell type uh, indeed could make both alveolar and bronchiolar organoids. So putting this all together, I've shown you that we were able to use a single cell RNA sequencing to compare the uh, transcriptional identities showing that our transplanted uh, alveolar organoid cells uh, retain an important ability uh, to restore their transcriptional state back to uh, that that mo more closely resembles the normal AT2 cell. And that uh, using several different assays, we can show that the progenitor cell potential of these cells uh, is retained when they are engrafted into recipient mouse lungs. And of course, we're um, doing many more studies to understand what's happening in these transplanted mice and how we can um, use them perhaps for more uh, interesting beneficial experiments. And so with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for your attention. Uh, I wanna thank the people in the lab that have done this work. Um, it's actually been really fun to give this talk. Thanks for your patience. It's one of the first times I've been talking about this aging lung and G9A story. So I would love your feedback. And it's been really fun also because so many different people in my lab contributed to the projects I talked about. Uh, Antonella Dost uh, and Aaron Moy uh, focused on the tumor organoid work. Uh, Sharon Mo Louie, a former postdoc, performed the transplantation studies along with Emery Liu and Erhan Arahat. Uh, Margie Paschini is a critical member in every single one of our experiments. Uh, Carolina and Patri did all the aging lung studies, uh, and Sam has led up our G9A work. And uh, this is just an old picture of us celebrating Halloween by being all the different lung cell types. So I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Really <laughs> exciting. Um, and I think for a lot of us who study different epithelial tissues, it's easy to connect with and kind of push us in our own systems. Um, so I just wanted to start with the first question and ask, you, you showed in your organoid system, it's pretty much always a co-culture with stromal cells. And so I'm wondering about when you're doing the aging experiments, are you including stromal cells from the same age or are you always using young stromal cells or how does that work? Yes, thank you for the question. And you're right. In the work that I showed you, we're doing the co-culture. In this case, the supporting cells we use as our standard is from neonatal mice. So they are not from the same animal. Uh, however, we are working to do what you're proposing perhaps, which would be to, to actually determine what is the effect of the aging mesenchyme. 
And that's what we really love about the system. We've been able to take, for example, mice that were bleomycin treated and take their mesenchymal cells and see how does that affect a normal epithelial cell or vice versa. So those are some other experiments that we still need to do more of, but definitely on the list. Awesome. Um, so there's a question um, from uh, Claudio Scafolio about there's a, a difference in morphological progression of lung adenocarcinoma between humans and mice. Do you have any insight in this? Okay, thank you for the question, Claudio. And I apologize, I didn't really explain adenocarcinoma versus other types of lung cancer today. Uh, so uh, let's see. So is there a functional difference in morphological progression? So I should say that lung adenocarcinoma, there are still different subtypes of it. Uh, there can be more mucinous adenocarcinoma versus some that are not mucinous. Some of this can be dictated by the predominant oncogenic changes that drive those cancers. Uh, for the, the KRAS-driven lung cancers, we think the mouse model you know, represents and recapitulates a lot of those key features. Uh, however, there are certainly differences. There's important differences between mouse and human lung. Uh, one of the things that Ed Morrissey's group has published is uh, and, and pointed out that there's an entire structure in the human lung called the respiratory bronchial that basically doesn't exist in the mouse. And so uh, it's important to consider these differences. And uh, a lot of what we're also trying to do is work on you know, using human lung cells in our organoid systems and try to go back to the human lung biology too as well. Perfect segue. So, so Bridget asked the question about whether the, the methylation marks and some of the cell type phenotypes might be um, shared in old and young human. Yes, thank you, Bridget. And thanks again for all your previous help and uh, leading to collaborations. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, we have been growing human lung organoids where we isolate the HT280 positive cells, which is a way of enriching for the human AT2 cell. And we have observed so far and you know, it's a lower number of samples. We do see that the AT2 cells are less able to grow organoids when they're from the old uh, patient samples. Uh, and we're working with um, some of the public data sets to take a look at uh, the gene expression of some of the regulators of these methylation marks or their targets. We haven't stained the human old lung tissue yet to see about the methylation marks, but that's on the list to do. So, so far we think, you know, there are some clues from the, the public single cell uh, sequencing that, for example, it does look like there's, you know, some interesting differences in, in some of the targets that maybe G9A regulates. So we'd love to explore that more. Great. Um, so Ari Srivatsan asks about um, what would happen if you inhibit the bronchial stem cells during uh, aging? Yes, thank you. So uh, we, we definitely would, would love to do that experiment. We're thinking about how to do that better. Um, one of the things that um, I didn't talk about, but there's a really nice paper from Ju Hyung Lee's lab, and she showed that in, in normal mice, like young mice, um, that there are a subset of these bronchiolar progenitors that can make AT2 cells. And she shows how one of the ways that works is through notch uh, signaling. So if they have sustained notch signaling, they do more of this making AT2 cells. Now, we'd love to perhaps modulate that pathway and say, does that impact which progenitor uh, does this kind of repair? And is that something that doesn't happen the same way with age. So that's one thing we'll be trying. Excellent. And um, one, one more question from Bridget about after transplanting the organoids, how, how long have you actually gone out to see if they're still integrated into the lung? Yes, thanks. So uh, in what I've shown you, we've gone up to about a little bit over 100 days. Uh, and we see retention of those DS-RED positive cells. Uh, 
Uh, we now have some experiments where the mice have been over six months or so, and we're doing the experiments right now to see if they're still retained and do they still have you know, all the same capacity there. So we'll have to update you next time on that. And have you tried comparing whole organoids versus single cell from organoids versus like partially digested organoids? Hmm. So in all of our work, we've just delivered single cell suspensions, but it certainly is, there's so many derivations of this that you can do. And, you know, other groups are, are developing these methods too. Some of them have used other types of lung injury to precondition the recipient. And uh, they've seen some differences. Uh, we've also explored how different progenitor types might need a different experimental preconditioning to be able to retain the cells. So um, I think it's, it's certainly gonna be uh, fun to try some of those other experiments. Excellent. Perfect. Well, um, it's just, just a, a minute or two before one. So I think uh, I'm just going to thank you for giving us the time and sharing with us some really exciting research. I think it's, it's very inspiring for me and I, I think uh, many others attending as well. And um, we, we look forward to seeing you in person again soon. So thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.